with jaw-dropping natural beauty and an array of unusual and unique native animals. It's easy to see why New Zealand is rapidly becoming the filming destination of choice. So whether it's the scenery that's grabbing your attention or maybe you just want to stand tall in Hobbiton. This week on Planet Cruise Weekly, we're giving you the lowdown on what to see and what to do when cruising in New Zealand. Well, hello and welcome to episode 77 of Planet Cruise Weekly. I'm Keith, ex-cruise director, lots of experience cruising around the world, having fun, and of course, doing these shows now for Planet Cruise. And every week we explore an area of the cruising world and really put it under the microscope. I'm joined by different people every week and today I'm very excited to have one of the Planet Cruise team here, a good friend of mine, Paul. Paul, I believe you're a, you're a fan of New Zealand. If I was to ask you to describe it to me in three words, what would you, what would you say? Oh, I can do it in three. I can do it in four. Lord of the Rings. <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> because of course, uh, much of Lord of the Rings, in fact virtually all of Lord of the Rings, I think was filmed in New Zealand. Yep. So if you're a fan of those films and the scenery, then you're going to be a fan of New Zealand. Now, although many people think that Australia and New Zealand are the same, the island nations coexist in the South Pacific as close neighbours with completely different personalities. New Zealand has the strongest Maori culture in all of Polynesia, and if you've seen the breathtaking, sweeping vistas portrayed in blockbuster movies like The Lord of the Rings, you won't be disappointed, because this is where they're filmed. The early Polynesian inhabitants called New Zealand Ataroa, which basically means the land of the long white cloud. And ever since European traders and whalers arrived in the late 18th century, it's retained a reputation for being ruggedly beautiful and mysterious, a land of geysers and glaciers and a wonderful fusion of Maori and British culture. It was the first country to give women the vote in 1893, and it was also the first country to offer state pensions and state housing for workers. The country is neatly packaged up into two halves. The North and South Islands are separated by the Cook Strait, which at its narrowest is only 19 kilometers wide. The North Island is more heavily populated, featuring bigger cities. They include Auckland and the nation's capital, Wellington. Now, the South Island is the true star of the show, with its wide open spaces, spectacular mountains, lakes, and glaciers. From the Bay of Islands at the top of the North Island to the dramatic Fiordland in the far south, Cruising New Zealand opens up a world of natural wonders and reveals a vibrant culture. So when is the best time to actually visit New Zealand? Well, New Zealand is best enjoyed during the peak summer months of December, January and February, although the cruise season officially kicks off in early October, with most of the major activity winding down towards the end of April. Between May and September, only a handful of ships visit, with no activity at all in July, the first month of winter. Now, New Zealand has a high annual rainfall, which is spread evenly throughout the year, and it's famous for weather, which can change rather unexpectedly. Locals aren't joking when they say you can experience four seasons in a single day. In the far north, you can have subtropical weather during the summer, but inland, alpine areas of the South Island can be as cold as minus 10 Celsius in the winter. Now, the average New Zealand temperature decreases as you travel south, with January and February the warmest months. In summer, the average maximum temperature ranges between 20 and 30 degrees Celsius, which is about 70 to 90 degrees Fahrenheit, depending on where you are. Always pack layers and rain gear, and remember, like Australia, summer is also a standard holiday period for families, so expect more crowds around major attractions and tourist spots, including beach resorts. So if you do choose to cruise around New Zealand, what are the main port highlights? Well, we've got to start with Auckland. And it's the only city in the world built on top of an active volcanic field created by over 60 separate volcanoes. It's a true maritime city with a, a vibrant waterfront district, a busy harbour and an iconic bridge that offers up fantastic views of Rangitoto Island, Devonport and the Waikatiri Ranges. Now you can hop on a ferry to Wahiki Island for a magical mix of forest, beaches, farmland and vineyards or you can experience the dramatic volcanic coastline from above on a hand gliding tour. Maybe hike through the lava fields and caves of Auckland's youngest and largest volcano, Rangitoto, or maybe climb to the top of the Sky Tower for a 360 degree uninterrupted view from over a thousand foot up. Just be forewarned that even the floor is glass and therefore it's not for the faint of heart. It's not for me. No. It's not for me. It's not for Paul. No. No. Not only is he accident prone, but he gets bad vertigo. Yeah. 
But if you do like to live life in the fast lane, then there is an option to bungee jump off the Sky Tower for a, a mere 600 foot. It's nothing. No. It's nothing. No. So next up, we're going to look at Wellington. Now, situated on the Cook Strait, Windy Wellington, as it's affectionately referred to, is New Zealand's capital city and a haven for foodies and coffee lovers. This hilly city is often compared with San Francisco, and one of the best ways to explore it is by the excellent cable car system. Now, on your way to the top of Mount Victoria, you will see an eclectic mix of wooden cottages, art deco sculptures, fountains and galleries. Now, once you've enjoyed the view, the best way down is through the protected forested slopes of the stunning botanical gardens full of conifers and fragrant roses. Now, heading out of town into the mountains, Wairapa is an enchanting rural area full of lakes and rivers. It's called the, the land of glistening waters by the Maori, and it's the very heart of New Zealand's wine trail. Um, and a call into the historic village of Martinborough will plunge you headfirst into the award-winning winemaking traditions of this very trendy, very bohemian area. Finally, no visit to Wellington would be complete without a chance to tread in the footsteps of Gandalf and Frodo through the lands of Middle Earth and visit the filming locations used for the gardens of Isengard, Rivendell and Lothorian. And that's where you'll find me. And next up we have Taranga. Now, initially settled by the Maori in the late 13th centuries, Taranga is situated midway on the North Island's eastern coast and is situated within Captain Cook's renowned Bay of Plenty. A popular coastal town with subtropical climate, Taranga features beautiful golden beaches, lush parks and a laid-back atmosphere while offering an array of outdoor adventures including dolphin watching, hiking, fishing, sailing and diving. Taranga is your gateway to the steaming hot springs, geysers and exploding mud pools of Rotorua, a stronghold of Maori culture and crafts and New Zealand's primary tourist attraction. Other highlights include a trip to the Rainbow Springs where you can amble about the trout pools and spot the numerous varieties of indigenous trees and exotic birds such as the kiwi. But my favourite place has to be the New Zealand farm experience where you can see the sheepdogs work the sheep and cows and, and witness the unbelievable speed of the sheep shearing demonstration. And you might be looking at me thinking, what's he talking about? Who wants to see sheep shearing? But trust me, it's fast, it's high octane and it's great entertainment. So next up we have Dun Eden and this is home to the only castle in New Zealand. This South Island port is also regarded as the country's architectural heritage capital. The foundations of New Zealand's richest architectural heritage were built on the gold rushes of the 1860s. And today, Victorian and Edwardian buildings can still be seen at every turn. Dunedin's Scottish heritage is everywhere, from the statue of Robert Burns in the Octagon, the eight-sided heart of the central city, through to the country's only whisky distillery. Now we're going to talk about Akaroa, and this is your gateway port for Christchurch. But you know, well worth exploring in its own right as it's a haven for artists, gardeners and holidaymakers, happily. Now the town is a former French and British settlement. It's nestled in the heart of an ancient volcano and its name literally means Long Harbour in Maori. And it's an undeniably picturesque location at every turn. It's very easy to explore on foot, but if you do have the time and good weather, venture further out and explore the dramatic outer bays, or maybe go for a swim with New Zealand's own Hector Dolphins. If you do head into Christchurch itself, then you're sure to fall for the English charm of this beautiful garden city. That's right, the Avon River winds its way through Christchurch while people cycle the paths beside it and the flat bottom punts glide along it. Now you can join a guided bike tour or go it alone on a vintage style bike or head up to the skies for a helicopter tour. Now nature lovers should head along to the Christchurch Botanical Gardens, the largest inner city park in New Zealand. And wildlife lovers should check out Orana Wildlife Park. Here you can feed giraffes or get up close and personal with a rhino. You could even bump into one of New Zealand's elusive national birds, the kiwi. Now next we're going to discuss the Bay of Islands. This was named by Captain James Cook in the late 18th century and it's a string of 144 picturesque islands and hidden bays. And it was the first area of New Zealand to be settled by Europeans. It's ideal for anyone with an interest in the history of the indigenous Maori culture or just a love in spectacular landscapes and marine life. Key historical attractions include New Zealand's first capital called Russell, lovely chap, 
uh, and other attractions uh, include the house where New Zealand's most important document, the Treaty of Wangitangi, and forgive me if I've pronounced that wrong, was signed in 1840. I'm going to have various emails now from people around New Zealand. Yeah. And other activities include taking an ocean safari to swim with dolphins, sailing on a yacht, or paddling on a Maori canoe, or even kayaking. Okay, so next up we have the Fjordland, and not a port of call as such, but a popular scenic cruising region featured on many itineraries. South Island's Fjordland is a place of dramatic, eye-popping scenery carved by glaciers over 100,000 years. The landscape is steep fjords, lush rainforests, cascading waterfalls and mirror-like lakes with granite peaks untouched for centuries. A World Heritage Site, the region's three key attractions for cruise passengers are Milford, Dusky and Doubtful Sounds, with Milford once described by Rudyard Kipling as the eighth wonder of the world. So we thought it would be interesting to give you some other general information that you might find useful if you are planning a trip out to New Zealand. The first thing is that New Zealand has a visa waiver system, which means that people from a long list of countries visiting for three months or less don't actually need a visa to enter the country. Countries on the list include Australia, handily, uh, most European nations and the United States. But if you're a British passport holder and can prove your residence in the UK, you can stay for up to six months in New Zealand. Handy. Which is an absolute bonus. And and this really is great news for Brits because although most of the main areas worth visiting in New Zealand are accessible from the major ports, travelling around the country isn't difficult pre or post cruise and if you are going to travel all that way on a very long flight it does make sense to make the most of the trip. So there are several different ways to in a sense supersize your cruise trip out to New Zealand. For example, you can purchase one of Air New Zealand's Explorer Passes and fly around the country with domestic airports at many popular locations, making almost every part of the country accessible. You can rent a car and self-drive, which is by far the most popular as it allows so much flexibility, or you can travel by train. New Zealand's trains cater largely to tourists and they offer undeniably scenic journeys through remote national parks, across volcanic landscapes, and alpine passes and along the rugged coastline. Now, if you want a more immersive Middle Earth experience beyond a ship's tour, and who wouldn't, consider adding on an independent pre or post cruise tour. More than 250 locations throughout New Zealand were used to make the extraordinary Lord of the Rings and the Hobbit trilogy movies. And there are in-depth tours from major cities, including Queenstown on the South Island and Rotorua on the North Island ranging from a couple of days up to three weeks, heaven. <laughs> so hopefully that's given you a bit more of an idea about New Zealand. We think it's an amazing part of the world to cruise. Still not really uh, fully explored by many cruise passengers. Most people, yes, have had a chance to go out to Australia, but some people have not even considered New Zealand. So we hope we've tempted you, we hope you changed your mind. Uh, and if you want any more information, then uh, click the link and it will take you through to some of our amazing team. They're destination experts, they're full of knowledge, they're there to help uh, and give you great advice on various cruises that you could do and take uh, to go out and enjoy New Zealand. Um, now, if people want to get in touch and comment and kind of feedback, Paul, how do they do that? Well, it's nice and easy. You can contact us at hello at planetcruise.co.uk on the email. Or you can, of course, like us on Facebook. Uh, follow us on Twitter and of course subscribe to us on YouTube and you can comment on the videos below. Mm. And subscribing to us on YouTube in case you don't know is completely free just means you get little updates when we release a new episode or a new bit of cruise information so it's quite a handy thing to do. Now out of the people that got in touch throughout the last week I want to say a big thank you and hello first of all to David John Derbyshire. Uh, he commented um, on one of our deals to do with celebrity on Facebook saying oh no not Sean going on another celebrity cruise by any chance. Uh, yes, we know that Sean, of course, our presenter from Ideal World, um, and that's the Ideal World Panic Cruise Show, which is every Tuesday night at 8 o'clock. He's a big fan of celebrity and has been filmed many times. He is, he is always on a celebrity cruise. He's always on a celebrity cruise. Always. Yeah, he, he basically lives his life on a cruise. So, Sean, if you're watching this, do some work. <laughs> uh, and a big thank you also to uh, Stephen Raymond who sent in the question about Britannia and he, Stephen said are there any three, uh, free drinks on P&O Britannia? Uh, the answer Stephen is yes there are, um, you've got the water coming up the tap in your cabin, uh, you've got hot tea and coffee up uh, in the buffet area on deck um, and you could probably ask for a free glass of water in most of the bars as well. Apart from that it's the same as any other cruise ship, uh, you get what you pay for. Uh, some ships, of course, are all inclusive. Yeah. Britannia is not one of those at the moment. Um, but even if it's all inclusive, you are paying for it somewhere. Um, so yeah, either if you meant alcohol, 
you certainly do have to pay for it, but still a fantastic ship and still well worth going. Uh, thanks for your questions, thanks for your comments, keep them coming, thanks for watching. We hope to see you next week uh, for another exciting episode of Planet Cruise Weekly from myself and Paul. Ta-ra.